Well, I always enjoy the opportunity to be able to worship the Lord, but what better day to do it on the day that we celebrate His resurrection? If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll have the verses up there on the screen if you don't have yours. And if you remember, last week I started a two-part series. I opened up last week by sharing some quotes, quotes that have really defined the 20th century. We saw a quote that led to a whole movement towards racial equality, another quote that has led us to want to go out and explore space. And I said, as much as these quotes have had power, they don't reflect the six greatest words that I believe were ever spoken. Because as those quotes showed, we talked about last week, those quotes showed us very clearly that words have the power to alter the course of history. And these six words that we're going to look at, three last week and three this week, these are the greatest words I believe that were ever spoken. I believe that they're words that we're not just going to be here to celebrate something that happened in the past, but these are words that can give you meaning in your life right now. But more importantly, these are words that can give you a future hope beyond this life. So last week, I dealt with the first three words. If you remember, these are the words that Jesus Christ said on the cross, his final words that he said before he took his final breath. And this is what he said, it is finished. And I told you, that when those words were claimed by Jesus on that cross, there are certain things that now we can receive. That not tomorrow, not next week, but the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, because of those words, these are the three things that you guys can receive because of that. Here's the first one. How about forgiveness? You see, if we're all honest with each other, we all know that we're sinners, right? We've all broken God's law. And because we have broken God's law, there is a debt or a payment that must be paid for breaking His law. It's no different than right now if you guys were to go out and break the laws of this land. If you were to break the law, what would happen? You'd go before a judge. And the judge would say, before I let you go, there is a payment that must be paid for you breaking that law. And that's the same case. As sinners, we stand before the creator of this world. We stand there as sinners. And he's saying, there is now a payment that must be paid. And I don't know about you, but myself, as I stand there, I realize how guilty that I am and how hopeless I am. But the moment that I'm about to be declared guilty by the, the creator of this world, you know what words come out? The words that Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. In that moment, we know that our debt has been paid. That payment that we owe has been paid. And because of that, what Jesus said on that cross, because of what he did for you and I, there is now forgiveness for our sins. But a second thing that is available because of what Christ did on that cross, and through those words, it is finished. How about freedom? You see, we no longer have to walk bound or slaves to our sin. Because of those words on the cross, yes, we will go out of this place and we'll struggle. We all know that. No one in this room is perfect. But in our struggle, we don't have to walk in slavery or being bound to our sin. You know what we can do? We can walk out in the victory that Jesus Christ has provided for us. And the third thing, because of those powerful words that is finished, that we can receive is peace. At this very moment, you can receive peace or like the word reconciliation. And what's this reconciliation I'm talking about? It is reconciliation between us as sinners and who? A holy, righteous, and just God. You see, before Christ went to that cross, you know how we were seen by God? As lawbreakers. As enemies who walked in contrary to what He told us to walk like. But because of those words that is finished, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, guess how God sees us from now on? No longer as his enemies, no longer as a lawbreaker, but now he sees us as his children. He calls us his children. And I hope you recognize the power of those words on that cross that is finished. Because as much as those are powerful, the next three words today we're going to look at are just as powerful. Because here we have the scene. The women come to the tomb of Jesus. And as they go in, they hear these powerful words right here. He has risen. So before I begin to unpack those words for you, I want to set a context for you. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Maybe you're sitting here and you've heard the story about Jesus' death a thousand times, so I'm merely saying something you already know. Or maybe for the very first time, this is the first time you've heard it. But I want you to be like an investigator today, like a reporter. I want you to hear some of the details that I'm about to share with you. And you come to the conclusion that you want to come to, and I'll share my conclusion about what this means. Because we're going to see that in these words, there's power and what it has for our lives today. So I want to take you back to the death of Jesus on the cross. And we're told in the Bible that Jesus was crucified about the third hour. So the day he would go to Pontius Pilate about six in the morning, he put on trial, he was condemned to death. And about, um, as it would be in our time, the third hour would be 9 a.m. in the morning was Jesus Christ went to that cross. And then we know at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Jesus said those final words that we just talked about, it is finished. And he took his last breath and died. 
So maybe you guys are better in math than I am, but you know how many hours that Jesus would have been on that cross? For six hours. For six hours, he'd have been experiencing a high level of humiliation, but beyond that, he'd be experiencing suffering for you and I. And I talked last week about how crucifixion was one of the worst forms of execution possible. What we find from medical doctors is that how people mostly died on the cross was through what we call asphyxiation. Basically, what that means is your body cannot get enough oxygen and you stop breathing, you suffocate. So this picture, for six hours, here's Jesus. He's struggling to breathe. And while he's struggling to breathe, he's facing dehydration, a severe loss of bodily fluid, and multiple organ failure. This is what Jesus went through for six hours. And after he took that final breath, we know the story. The soldiers came over. They saw that he was dead. Rather than breaking his legs, they took a spear and thrust it to his side. And this is how the Gospel of John describes it. It says, At once there came out blood and water. Now I was interested to understand what blood and water is. I don't have a medical background. Maybe you do, so you can explain this better than I can. So I decided to read an article by a doctor to say, why would blood and water come out of Jesus' side? What is going on here? And so the doctor said that what most likely happened, the spear went through Jesus' right lung into his heart. And as that spear was pulled out of his side, pericardial effusion and pleural effusion, which for those of you that are looking at it like I did when I read it, what it meant was that fluid around his heart and his lungs would come out. And the doctor said when that spear would come out, guess what it would look like? Exactly the way John described, he said it would be a clear fluid like water followed by a large volume of blood. Now, why am I sharing this with you? I thought we were going to talk about it is finished today, right? Why are you telling me about Jesus' death? Because I want you to understand that we have strong historical and medical confirmation that Jesus was in fact dead. And see, those words, he is risen, has no significance, does it? If he didn't die, then he can't rise from the grave. And so we have this evidence to show that Jesus Christ was dead. I've read books by people who aren't even Christians who say we, it's not even debatable whether Jesus Christ was dead. We know historically and medically that he was. And without his death, he has risen, has no significance. That's why it's so important. And so we go back to our story. After the Roman governor Pilate received confirmation from the soldiers that Jesus was dead, I call it the death certificate. They've gotten the death certificate from him. The governor, the Roman governor says, you can take his body down from the cross and you can lay it in a tomb. And that's where we're going to pick up our story, but I want to stop right here. I want you to picture what Jesus Christ has gone through for the last several hours on that cross and the significance of what that meant and the details of what I just shared with you. Because if you lose sight of those details, when I talk about he is risen, those are just three words that I could say. Any other words up here would make no difference. But when you understand what's leading up to those words, you understand the power that they have with it. So we go to verse 1 of Luke 24. And this is what it says. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. So I want to give you a few details about this verse. First of all, who came to the tomb? It was women from Galilee. If you have your Bibles, you can go to verse 10 of that chapter and it lists them. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other women with them. And I'll explain to you the significance about women being the ones that were there in a little bit. And so here's these women. When did they come to the tomb? Our verse tells us the first day of the week, which is what? Sunday, the very day that we come here and we celebrate and we worship. And then the last one is why did they come to that tomb? We know from the passage, they came with spices to anoint Jesus' body for burial. Now, if you've been following me along like a good reporter, you would say, well, wasn't he already in the tomb? Why are they preparing for his body for, for death if he's already dead, he's already in the tomb? Because what happened was when Jesus was taken off of that cross, he had to be quickly placed into the tomb because the Jewish Sabbath was coming upon them. If you know anything about the Jewish Sabbath, for a good Jewish person, you rested on that day, you didn't work that day. So they didn't fully prepare his body. So here's these women. They're good Jewish women. They rest on the Sabbath. And the very next day, that first day of the week in the morning, they go with these spices to do the final burial preparations for Jesus. And I want you to grasp two things about this before we move on to our next verse. Two keys about what I'm talking about here. Here's the first one. These women had no expectation that Jesus had risen from the grave. They came with spices for what reason? To anoint his body. In the gospel of Mark, it says in Mark chapter 16, verse 3, that as they went to the tomb, they're talking amongst themselves, who is going to remove away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? 
Because our passage in Mark says that stoom was, in the Greek it says the word magos was a, literally a massive or a very large stone. So they're going there to prepare Jesus' body for death. And they're like, who is going to move that stone? Their expectation that day is not what we're going to see that they found out. The second thing, and to me the more powerful thing about this, these women, is it shows their strong devotion and love for Jesus Christ. You see, while Jesus was alive, they spent their whole time showing devotion and love for him. And now here he is, they're showing that same devotion as they go to the tomb to take care of his body that is dead. And because of their devotion to the Lord, guess what the consequence is for them? They become the very first ones to hear the message of the resurrection. I hope you know how powerful that is. Because I look out in this room today, and I know some of you, some of you I don't know, but I imagine there's been moments in your life you felt very insignificant, right? You look at your life and say, is my life making any difference? Does anyone even know that I'm alive? And I think there's power in that fact that Jesus chose women to be the very first ones to proclaim the resurrection message. You see, if they were to walk into a court of law at that time, their testimony was not valid because they were women. And here's Jesus saying, you know what, maybe in the eyes of the culture they're not valid, but in my eyes these women are very valid. They're worthy for them to be the very first ones to proclaim this message because they were the very first ones who showed devotion to come and take care of me. That's a powerful thing. Because what does their message do? It transforms history forever. And I look out at many of you, and I, and I hope today you've come to hear the power of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is about. But if it's only about what it does for you, then you've missed what this message is about. Because it's about you taking this message out into this world and sharing with others how Jesus Christ has transformed your life. Because you often look and say, well, pastor, that's your job. You've got the background. Who am I? How can I make a difference? And I'll tell you what, you want to know how you can make a difference? Just like these insignificant women. You can take a message, you can transform lives today with the truth of what we're talking about today. So now that we have these women at the tomb, we go to verse 2 through 4. And it says, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. So now we see the women coming. What does this verse tell us? These verses, should I say? They now describe what they saw when they went to the tomb. What's the very first thing they saw? That stone was rolled away. That conversation on the way to the grave, well, how are we going to move it? Guess what? They get there, and all of a sudden, the stone is now removed. We find out in Matthew's gospel that it was moved by God's supernatural hand as he sent an angel down to remove it. And I want you to understand how significant that stone is, that it's moved is. You know why that stone was moved? Please understand it was not moved to keep Jesus in. It was moved to allow the women to go in and see what happened. And so we see this stone is moved, and the next thing they uncover is the tomb was empty. That means when they walked in, the body of Jesus was not there. And I want to pause here for a moment because I want you to place yourself in the position with those women. Here you are coming to the tomb of Jesus Christ. You're coming with spices to anoint his body. And as you get there, you encounter these things that were not what you expected to see. And so how are they in the response to what they're seeing? It says that they are perplexed. Not a very good word. Because in the Greek, you know what that word means? It means to be at a loss. You ever been in a situation in life where you've heard something, you saw something, and you're just like, I'm at a loss. I got nothing to say. I got no words to say what I just saw or what I just heard. That's exactly how this woman were. They don't understand what is going on, nor do they know what to do next. So in this perplexed, why are they that way? Because once again, that encounter they had with the empty tomb did not meet their expectation. They did not expect to come and find a stone rolled away to find the tomb empty. And so in this state of confusion, we find the next thing that they see. And our our verse says that they saw two men standing by them in dazzling apparel. We know from the other Gospels that these two men were actually angels. And I love the way they're described because I don't know what your translation says. Mine says dazzling apparel. Some say shining garments. And it's describing how they would look. So I imagine one, one, one of these days, go outside during a thunderstorm. And when you see lightning strike and the light that comes from the lightning, that's what they saw. A flash of lightning like from a lightning bolt. And so in the midst of all that they saw, we see their response. And think about their response would be our response. Here we are. Our expectations are much different than what we saw. We see these two angels that are with this glazing glory. And so here's their response in verse 5 and 6. And it says, And as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. 
So now with the appearance of the angels, listen, these women are not only perplexed and confused, but they are now afraid. And I want you to keep that state of mind because I'll come back to where they're at right now. But then here's what the men or these angels say to them. A very powerful question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? See, they ask the woman a question. It's like they're looking at the women and saying, why are you surprised? Why are you confused? Like, why do you respond the way that you are? And in that question, they come back now to say this statement, he is not here but has risen. That means he has risen. They declare to the women why the tomb is empty. Because he is not here, he has risen from the grave. What I want to do with you guys, just like the angels, is you keep that perspective of how they felt that morning. I want to ask you a question now. And all the little details that I've given you, it's now time for you to start to draw your own conclusions today. Because I want you to be very clear. Your faith with Christ has no bearing upon myself here today. I cannot save you. My message can't save you. The only one that can is the one who gave your life for you. And so what conclusions do you draw from what we heard? Because here's my question. Do you think those words he has risen are significant and have value for our lives today? Or on a personal level, are they significant? Do they have value for your life today? That's the question that we're here for. And so with that question, I'm going to draw my conclusion for you. I believe when those women walked in, they encountered what they encountered, and those words were spoken, he has risen. There are three guarantees for anyone in this room today who gives their life to Jesus Christ. And here's the very first guarantee. It's the guarantee of truth. You see, the angels declare that Jesus was risen, and this is what they go on to say to the women in our passage here. It says, remember how he referring to Jesus told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise. So he's saying, did, did, he's looking at the women, he's angels, and saying, don't you remember, he's already told you about what's going on here today. He's told you he's going to die and rise again. And I love the next verse. Words that don't seem significant, but this is what it says. And they, referring to the women, remember Jesus' words. He said, I want you to hear this. In the state of confusion and fear that they're in, It was not the fact that the stone was moved. It was not the fact that the tomb was empty. And it wasn't the fact that there was a presence of angels there. You know what took away their fear and their confusion? Remembering the words of Jesus Christ. You see, in my own life, there's times where I say, God, I just don't know what's going on in my life. I feel like there's so many why questions. Why am I going through this? And there's times where I feel alone and I feel fearful. Yeah, even a pastor feels that way. And I'm like, God, your presence seems so far away. And in those moments, don't we all cry out, God, just show me a sign you're there. Give me some supernatural reality that you're there. And don't you see that all we need is what these women need. We need to be remembered what Jesus' words are about. You see, it's in the words of Jesus where power comes. It's in words of Jesus where the fear that we have and that confusion that we have, God can bring hope and he can bring joy in the midst of it. So I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know what struggles, I don't know what's brought fear into your life, what's brought confusion into your life, but I'll tell you, you don't need a supernatural intervention. You know what you need? You need to remember the words of Jesus Christ. And so from these words, we draw this very powerful conclusion. Because you tell, BJ, isn't this a guarantee of truth? What truth here? Well, don't you understand that Jesus based his whole identity upon this claim? He was going to die and rise from the grave. That means if what we're celebrating today did not happen, Jesus is a liar. He's not truthful to who he said he is and what he would do. And in fact, you know what the Apostle Paul says? He says, if Jesus Christ has not been risen from the grave, then your faith and my faith is useless. It's a waste. There's no point for me to preach anymore. No point for you to come to church anymore without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the very fact that today we celebrate that the tomb was empty, that these angels declared he has risen, it shows us that the Christian faith is founded upon truth. That's the guarantee that we have in a day and an age where we all struggle with what to believe and what not to believe, right? You turn the news on and one news source says this, the next one says that, and you're like, how do I really know what's true? Well, one thing I can guarantee you is this, that the story today that Jesus Christ died and rose from the grave is a true story. And it's not just true because I'm giving you some facts, you will know why it's true, because it's rooted in the very one who is truth. I love these words by Jesus. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. And because of those words, he has risen. Today, all of us in this room have a guarantee that we believe in the one who is the truth. The second guarantee that we have is life. You see, I look out in this room today, 
And I see a lot of diversity, difference in ages, difference in background, difference in where you're raised at. But you know, there's a lot of things that unite us, but you know one of the things that unites us is that universal experience of pain and suffering and death, right? I mean, all of us have experienced it. I mean, it seems to be that pain and suffering is the universal experience of, of humans. And I look out there, and I'm sure many of you guys can say, yes, I know exactly what pain and suffering is. And it may be at different levels and different stages, but we've all gone through pain and suffering, haven't we? It's the universal experience of humans. But beyond that, death is the inevitable conclusion for all of our lives. So here we are, the universal experience of pain and suffering and the inevitable reality that life is going to end with death. And so what has history been about? People trying to cheat death, right? Right? We see it all the time, the desire to find that fountain of youth. In fact, there's a movement today, maybe you've heard of it, called transhumanism. Transhumanism teaches that we have a moral obligation or duty to use every technological means to stop aging and death. And so what they believe is that very soon we're going to have, we're going to be able to upload our brains into a computer that will allow you and I to live forever. And you're looking at me and you're like, okay, is this really going to happen? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. You or I do not have to wait for technology to advance to live forever in a digital world. Because of those words, he has risen. At this very moment, eternal life is available to all of us because Jesus Christ rose from that grave. The declaration that he has risen is an affirmation that he has conquered death for all of us. That through him, life is now available beyond the grave. And so while listen... Death may be inevitable for all of us. Through Jesus, it is not final or conclusive or the end. Jesus declared these powerful words when he stood outside the grave of one of his dear friends, Lazarus. As his sisters were weeping over his death, Jesus said these words I want you to hear. He says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Because of those words, he has risen It's not just a guarantee of truth, but it's a guarantee of life that we can believe in the very one who conquered the grave for us. And here's the last one, and perhaps to me the most powerful one. Because of those words, he has risen, we have the guarantee of hope. See, this past week I was able to visit with a dear friend of mine who was going through chemo treatments for cancer. And while I was there, we were talking about what she was experiencing, but the conversation began to go towards her son. I knew her son very well. And she was sharing with me about how what she's going through reminded her so much of what her son went through. And her son had passed away from cancer. So all those memories came back. And as we were talking about his life and the influence that he had and and all that he went through and what she's going through now, that room definitely had us all crying. But as she's sharing that story, I remember looking over to her husband and I saw those, those tears coming down her face. And I was reminded of myself what the Apostle Paul had said. You see, in the book of Thessalonians, Paul's writing to a church who had lost loved ones. And all of you, you've lost a loved one. You've been at a a funeral before. You you know what it means to grieve a lost loved one. And so here's Paul saying, look, I know you've lost some loved ones, but I want you to do, I want you to remember this. And I want you to hear what Paul says because these words of Paul were exactly what I saw their face as they were talking about their son. Paul says, look, in this life, you're going to mourn and grieve. And have we not all mourned and grieved before? We all have. We all know what loss is. But he says, I want you to understand, because of the resurrection of Christ, we do not mourn or grieve without hope. And that hope was on their face because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's a message that this world needs to hear. We live in a day and an age where hopelessness and despair overwhelm us. And what a reminder to say that Jesus Christ, because he has risen from that grave, there is not just hope in the present, but there is a future hope beyond this life. The reality, I want you guys to understand this, that because Jesus Christ has risen from the grave, he has prepared a future for you and me that is beyond what you can ever imagine. That the pain, the struggles, the suffering of this life will once be removed where we can enjoy being in his presence forever. A verse that I love to read all the time when I talk to people who have lost loved ones. This is what Jesus has guaranteed for us because he has conquered that grave. This is what it says. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow, crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. 
What a promise. What a reality that today we celebrate He has risen. It is not a celebration of something that happened in the past. It is a celebration that you and I, when we come to Jesus Christ, we have those three guarantees that guarantee that we are believing in truth, that we have life, and that we have hope. And so those who attend Truth and Grace on a regular basis know where I usually go at this point. I go to my closing challenge, right? But that's not where I'm going to go today. I'm going to go to an invitation. You see, even though I was raised in a Christian family, I'd gone to church, there was a moment in my life where I had to respond to whether or not I would accept Jesus Christ, whether I'd acknowledge my sin and accept what Christ has done on that cross for me. And it's the invitation I'm giving to you. I don't know where you stand with the Lord, but today is that invitation, that recognition that, 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 what, that is through the cross of Jesus Christ that forgiveness for your sins is now available. And it's through that resurrection that there is now hope beyond this life. And so the invitation is there for you to respond. And maybe you're here today and say, well, I've already responded to that invitation. But maybe the invitation for you is a little bit different today. Maybe today God is saying it's time to get real. It is time to fully surrender your life, to walk in obedience, to recognize that you have walked away from where where you should be at with the Lord. And God is saying, don't you want to come back to me and walk with me and let me bless you the way that I can bless you? And wherever you may stand, don't leave today without knowing what Jesus Christ has done. Because today, because of those words that is finished, you have that freedom or that forgiveness. You have that freedom and that peace with God. And because of the celebration of his resurrection, right now, this very moment, we have those guarantees of truth, of life, and of hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.